Wayne. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the August 11 Public Works Finance Committee meeting of the Moscow City Council. I'm Walter Steed, President of the City Council. To my right, sitting in, is Wayne Kraus, Council Member, my left. I'm used to having Dan tip the boat that way. Uh, Dan Carscallon, to his left, is City Supervisor Gary Reedner. First item on the agenda is the approval of the July 28 minutes. You and I were the... You, you two have to make readers. that. We were it. And I'm fine with them. Well, I guess I am also. All right. <laughs> Consider them approved, Gary. Thank you. Uh, number two, disbursements report for July of 2014, Don Palmer. See, Mr. Palmer's not here yet. Can I noticed that he was not here. I thought I would, go ahead. I would go ahead and call his name anyway. He's at the end of the line now, isn't he? Yeah, we're going to have to go to number hey, four. You can't do number three either. Uh, number three is also Don Palmer's item, and uh, I don't. he still hadn't shown up. Uh, no, here's footsteps. So. Number four. Mike Ray, are you present? Yeah, he there he is. Mike is here. At a lot line adjustment request for 1021 North Orchard. Tell us, tell us about it. Good afternoon. There we go. So we have a uh, lot line adjustment request uh, for a couple adjacent parcels on uh, one says frontage on Virginia and the other one on Orchard Avenue. And this is just to familiarize yourself with the <coughs> site. They're both outlined in red at the center of your screen. Uh, you've got Orchard running north-south there and then Virginia uh, triangular dead end there to the west. Looking at the zoning in the area, it's in the moderate density residential, which is our R2 zone. Uh, you have some swaths of R1 uh, to the east as well as to the south of these properties. Looking a little bit closer uh, at the two properties, one's about 19,830 square feet in size, the westerly one. Uh, the easterly one that has frontage on Orchard is 16,672 square feet in size. And basically the proposal uh, before you tonight is to shift the uh, separating lot line there. Uh, as you can see in red, 20 feet to the east basically to line that up with the eastern property line of the existing house on Virginia, just to run north-south there. And so you can see the uh, remainder, uh, the remnant lot line there, uh, which will be shifted there 20 feet to the east, uh, essentially resulting in the parcel on Orchard Avenue uh, to be about 14,700 square feet in size. Uh, with the additional square footage, the parcel on Virginia is going to be 21,809 square feet in size, uh, plus or minus. So... Just a review of the R2 zone, minimum lot width 60 feet, minimum lot area 7,000 square feet, and then you have your typical setbacks, 20 feet in the front, 20 feet in the rear, and a uh, combination of 15 with a minimum of 5 on the side. So uh, as a result of this lot line adjustment, both of those parcels and structures on those parcels will meet all setback and minimum lot size requirements. And so uh, with that, staff recommends approval of the lot line adjustment request, and that's with no conditions. Thank you, Mike. Um, this is at the request of one of the homeowners? There's two different homeowners involved. Yeah, it was at the request of the homeowner on Orchard Avenue, Marlene Chrysler. Uh, we also have a, a representative, uh, Bob Wakefield, here uh, representing the Chryslers. Okay, and but it's, it's owned by, the lots are owned by two different parties. Two different owners, correct. One party put the request forward, but both parties are in agreement with this proposal? Yeah, they both came to my office to submit the required documentation, and so, um, yes, they're both privy to it. Yes, sir. Mike, looks like at one time down the road, uh, lot 003A, that's the one that would be on the northwest corner, uh, Virginia Avenue Orchard. Looks like they must have had a lot line adjustment at one time. The picture that we have shows a dotted line and then a permanent line. It's on the plat, Mike, uh, plat hey, map. Mike. Mike. There you go. Oh, I got it right here. Got it. So it looks like at one time there may have been a lot line adjustment for whatever reason done to that one, and so this one simply makes it more consistent. Correct. Yeah, it usually indicates there's a previous lot line adjustment, yeah. and she had refer mentioned that to me uh, when she came in that she had previously purchased, purchased that 20 feet uh, from that neighbor to the northeast. So Yeah, so, yeah, I'm good. It sounds makes sense to me. I don't have a problem. Did I see your hand, Gary? No, I was curiosity more than anything. 
when you do the long line adjustment, you still have that little hook on the bottom. Um, mm. Seemed to me it would have been nice to clean that up and attach it to the other lot, but it's not my business. Yeah, I think no matter what parcel it ends up with, it may be a little. <laughs> yeah, still going to have a little bit of an oddity yeah. there. Yeah. Mr. Wakefield, do you have anything to add that will? Before, uh, before, before, forward, we, before, we, before we do what we're being asked to do, do you want to add anything to this? No, not really. Um, I'm the attorney for the estate of the late Russell Chrysler, who owned the property, uh, the lower property mm -hmm. there. And um, he uh, passed away at the age of 105 and a half. Wow. And um, his next door neighbor to the east. Uh, had been a very nice neighbor for him and had cared for him in the latter stages of his life. And his daughter lived in Canada, his son lived in Arizona, so he had always talked about giving this 20 feet. He, the neighbor to the west. Yes. Yeah. Did I say east? I meant west. Yeah. Sorry, the streets to the east. Um, uh, he had always talked about giving, when he passed away, giving that 20 feet back to the neighbor on the west and and that's what he wanted to do and that's why the estate is pursuing this lot line adjustment and then we've already found a buyer for the property the buyer is okay with doing that we're just going to issue the deed <coughs> as soon as the lot lines approved cool we'll be on our way okay, okay. Good. you bet thank you Bob. Okay, next item is Thank you. item five, a state local agreement for the middle school safety improvements. Alyssa Anderson and Kevin Lilly tag teaming. Good afternoon. Uh, we also presented this item to the administrative committee um, and received a three ditto vote. <laughs> <laughs> to move it forward, but um, this project was submitted to um, ITD, Idaho Transportation Department, in the spring of 2013, and we had an award in the fall. Um, since then, we've been working to um, come to terms with the contract that would work the way we were originally told that um, the project would be constructed and um, designed, those types of things. And so... Um, it being a new project or a new program and ITD having a lot of transition in their um, division of transportation performance, time kind of got away and we've um, worked with them um, on different versions. Long story short, um, we had a contract that was very, or a state local agreement that we're pretty comfortable with now. Um, we're working with their staff, um, but we got a call on Thursday that we were told that if we didn't have an executed agreement back to them by um, Thursday, that um, our grant award of $485,000 could be at risk or, or it would be unfunded at that point in time. So Kevin and I have been working with staff, and um, ITD has issued some uh, more information that we didn't have previously. We actually got the last piece of it today. And so we're comfortable going ahead and moving forward with the project. And so what we're here today is to ask the permission <coughs> to go ahead and allow the mayor to execute the document so that we can FedEx it in the morning. The corresponding resolution will still be able to go through council on Monday with a ratification of the contract through the normal process. So there were issues between the city and ITD that, that held this up, or what? Yes. Originally, the um, application, when we prepared <coughs> it, they told us that we, it would be the same process that we had used under the Safe Rest to School program, which was we designed it under city standards, and we also put it out to um, bid through our own process. Um, that was kind of a streamlined process normally compared to what ITD mm -hmm. would do. Um, so we prepared our project based upon those guidelines. Um, then um, they sent us a contract that had ITD bidding the project out themselves and procuring the 
um, design professional, if we needed to contract it out, they would also manage that process for us. And we um, kept waiting to get another contract that had amendments to it or changes. There was a lot of staff transition. And so um, the design guidelines that they originally thought they were going to have in place never did come to fruition. So right now at this point, um, we're going to be working as a team with the ITD District 2 office on um, the procurement for the design professional and also um, with them in moving forward with the construction process. But it is still somewhat simplified. It's not the full mm -hmm. federal highway process. So who's going to bid it, Kevin? That's still up in the air. We can neither bid it or have them do it. But uh, the previous contract, the previous agreement, when it was issued, listed the standards that it would be designed to um, the whole process that would that would be used for the project development was supposedly the community choices manual, which d did not exist. Uh, it was a new program they were trying to put together um, very quickly, and they didn't get all the background information uh, in place for the communities until recently. They still don't have that manual, so. Um, we weren't comfortable with the existing agreement. We sent that back twice. Um, it was contradictory in that whose standards we would use and, and whose standards who would bid the project. And so currently, um, thankfully, Jim Carpenter stepped in uh, as of just today and issued a, a new memo um, laying out those guidelines. and. We've had discussions with ITD, and we're comfortable we can use this agreement and work those details out with the district. If if ITD were to bid it, they normally put a twenty five percent. That's fee. that's been changing. Uh, the one we recently saw from LTAC had twenty seven or eight, um, but that's not under this same program. I guess the, the, these are details. I mean, I, th I think we want to build the project. Yeah, let's move forward. I want to move forward with it. I just don't particularly want to buy a pig in a poke and find out all of a sudden that we've got to come up with an extra X thousand dollars or we've got a project that's going to cost a number that, that the grant won't cover or something like that. That's all. Okay. So this project is not going through LTAC. So that 25% that you've seen on Polk and some of the other projects that we've worked on is is not the same scenario. Um, we'll be working directly with Ken Helm and his team in District 2 um, to uh, put this together. And so um, we're hoping to keep, you know, keep it to about $10,000 at the most. And but whatever we do, we will be within the limits of that grant. So our, our outlay will be that 7.34 percent okay mm -hmm. so, so the matching money is locked in then basically mm -hmm. yes and if, if we get um, in a bind for funds we will scale back the scope of the project rather than come back for more money okay yes so it wasn't that long ago that this money wasn't available i remember we kind of shelved this project didn't we i mean i just a couple of months ago because no, that was a I that think was Polk Street. That was Polk. Oh yeah. Okay. Different project. I we get them confused too, don't worry. There's several projects <coughs> going on right now. <laughs> Has the traffic circle been in here all along? Yes. In the parking lot. In the parking lot? Yeah. Didn't remember that. Okay, what you want to do guys? I move forward. Forward. We don't have any options. We don't want to lose Move, the money. Moving forward. We will present it for ratification on, on the consent agenda for the 18th. And in the meantime, direct Mr. Palmer to write a check, I guess. Already done. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Smart transit match request for bus replacement. Gary Reedner and... Jenny you're not, Ford. You are not Gary Reedner. I'm you're, not. You're much nicer <laughs> than we expected to have with Gary. A lot Welcome. younger. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Um, what we got? What I just passed out was uh, Walter had emailed me or left some uh, questions regarding uh, some uh, information about the smart fleet. <clears throat> so, um, in the interest of, uh, of a full disclosure, um, a member of your committee, Wayne Krause, is the current president of Smart Transit. I am also a board member. 
Um, so, um, and Gina Trucia is always also a board member. I don't know if I'm missing anybody else in here who is, but um, what you have before you today is a request for $25,000 which was budgeted in the FY 2014 budget by the City Council. Uh, council had approved $110,000 support for smart transit in the FY 2014 budget. Um, there was also an additional $25,000 that was placed in that line item for support of public transit purposes if it became necessary. Um, the idea behind it was that uh, if the the um, amount of support from the FTA coming to SMART through the um, uh, I Idaho Transportation Department, it was uncertain at the time, so the council wanted to put some buffering in there in case additional funding was needed. Uh, in this round of grants, uh, one of the submittals that SMART put forward was uh, for equipment, replacement of our buses. Uh, if you look at um, the diagram that you have before you, um, refer you to the matrix, you'll see all of the rolling stock that SMART has at this point. As you can see, except for just a couple of the vehicles, they've all got well in excess of 100,000 miles on them. Um, it's having been there longer than Jenny, and Jenny can certainly um, give her perspective as well. Uh, we have thinned the rolling stock at SMART over the last five years. There were several other buses that were also kept in reserve. Uh, that was kind of a hedge against one of the older buses going down or several of the older buses going down. Um, got rid of a bunch of those. The reason was because carrying them was an insurance cost. So in the interest of efficiency, a lot of those were weeded out. However, because of the, the issues with uh, having to have some in reserve, these buses break down with some frequency, and as they get well over 100,000 miles on them, the breakdowns become even more frequent and sometimes quite expensive and extended. So the uh, Jenny made an application this year of FTA funding to obtain, um, I can't remember the number. 5339. 53. Yeah, 5339 is the replacement program through ITD and district in District 2. We were the only ones that actually requested funding. Um, we didn't, SMART did not request the $307,000. However, that was what was available in District 2. So the um, committee determined to reward us all that money if we can use it. And it's a one, it's one time money. And the match is? 20%. In, in, in 20, is that pretty much it? Pretty much. I mean, we'll answer questions, but Good. The, okay. In 2013, you sold two rigs in excess of 180,000 miles apiece. Got hardly anything for them. Yes. Probably had to pay somebody to come up. Not quite, but off, it was but close. close. Okay. And you're looking for this new rig to acquire it with the city's $25,000 match to replace one of those. Correct, a paratransit bus. And then you have bus. a plan to try to replace the other one. Correct. Or we want to ha get a fixed route bus as well in 2015. Looking That's going to. Looking to replace those. One of those, correct? We're looking to to actually continue having a rolling stock that is f full. Um, we're looking to, when we had requested the funds from ITD, we had listed the 599 and 801 as vehicles that would be up for replacement because we had already um, surplused them. Mm -hmm. So those were included in the application. So those are the two you're replacing? Correct. Where I'm going is that's going to give you, for fixed route, well, now, one of those will be fixed There's route and one will not. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. And so as that, it can. I'm that'll sorry, give you one, order. two, three, four, five, six and a half fixed route buses. However, for if you see 409 and 420, even uh, 427, they're um, up to over 200,000 miles. I mean, that's definitely a vehicle that we're going to have to consider surplusing soon. I, I understand okay we got to run a bus today mm -hmm. and if the one we're planning to run won't run we got to have a bus that will run exactly I get it I'm just a little questioning 
how many buses do we need in the driveway in order to keep the service going? And you even mentioned insurance costs. I mean, I've done the same thing. I've been out to the city shop and seen what appears to be a lot of police cars sitting around out there. Mm -hmm. I later learned they were cannibalizing them because they could for parts and stuff. And I don't know if Don was insuring them or not. But at any rate, that's, that's the thrust of my question. So we're, two buses are running all the time, and just two just buses. two for the for the fixed routes. Just for our fixed route service, that's correct. And then we also have a separate paratransit vehicle that's on route. And that's dial a ride. Correct, dial a ride. And that only mm -hmm. one of those running at a time. Sometimes two. Sometimes two. There is sometimes a small overlap. Um, this vehicle that we're looking at um, is a much more efficient vehicle, and it would likely reduce our the necessity to have two vehicles excuse me, two vehicles on route when during our um, really busy times. I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't have a problem doing it, and I don't want to try and micromanage the transit system, but... No, as long as you keep just providing money, you won't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not trying to not provide money. Sure, I mean, right. I, I understand the opportunity to get a new bus. Right. I get it. But I probably wouldn't be even hesitating if to run the two fixed routes in Moscow while we're constantly sitting around wanting a third route, and yet to know that there are, there are, will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a dozen buses virtually out there with one or two of them running down the ride. There's... One, these two are replaced. One, two. They're being replaced. No. Those are sold. Those have already been sold. You said the one we're to put the 25 up will replace one of them. If I'm these down here. Yeah, one of the reasons that um, they were listed as replacements, when the new buses, if we obtain the funding to obtain those buses, I'm presuming we'll look at current stock and then rotate one, the worst so one out. one of these will be gone when a new one yeah, There's no intent to expand the fleet we're by not worried two about buses. Okay. okay, that's my, that was my what question I was earlier. Trying. I didn't make, I must not have made the question clear. I think I confused it, but <laughs> we don't intend to expand the fleet, correct? Correct. So the, 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 with the new buses, one of the, with the two new buses, because you've got a, a, a dial -a ride bus possibility also, then two of the upper Mm -hmm. Section one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine buses will be phased out. Well, and Walter, under nine ten, that's an actual minivan. It's not an actual bus. So it's used as mainly as an admin severe reserve. Two so of the upper eight buses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are they? Sure. We have eight buses and we roll in and out of stock. We could have, at any given time, a need for four buses on the road at one time. Generally speaking, we have one to two buses having maintenance done or repairs done at any given time. That could leave us, if we had two, two in the shop, four on the road with only two spares, and then if one of those went down. So we have, we have plenty of rolling stock. But do I think we have too but much? You, but I don't, you're not flush. I don't think so, you know, because we have to remember that we want to be able to deliver a service. And if you take a look at, for instance, uh, what, 404, that's the Walmart bus. Correct. If you'll see 404, it gets, it gets double duty sometimes. You'll see it on a fixed route, depending on what's going on. It could be on, a mo it could be on the... Uh, um, Dialeride. Dialeride, ride too, yeah. Right, yeah. It could be on that one. Now, this... One thing that, that is going to be beneficial is that the bus that Jenny wants to buy is one that is, is I, I call it a low rider. What's, what's the actual term for it? It's a low floor, an Arbok okay. low floor. <clears throat> it's going to reduce the amount of, of time for loading wheelchairs to half the amount of time it takes now, which is going to speed that dial ride system up to where we may not need to use two buses at a given time. So the efficiency will be will be substantially increased with that particular bus. 
And um, then as she finds the match money for the second bus, that'll replace one of the high mileage larger fixed route buses. And then we can give the high mileage buses away to our favorite charity. Because we sure can't get any money out of them. I'm wearing my grant hat. You, you, want, a, you want a bus? No. <laughs> no, but I do sit on the district coordinating council for transportation for district two, and I'm your grants manager. Um, the 5339 money that was available for this round of funding is some that had been accumulated by ITD for over the four year period, and it's not something we're going to see again. Um, we know under MAP 21 that type of funding doesn't come about anymore. And the transportation bill that was recently um, put into place to extend funding um, is about half of what it was for this type of um, um, funding for, you know, the smaller rural carriers to have capital purchases money. And it's become highly competitive in the state to have any money available for capital purchases. And so my feeling is that you won't see this opportunity come forward again and if you don't take advantage of it now that money will go to another district I'm not questioning the opportunity I'm not having a problem with the opportunity to get a new bus I'm questioning the size of the fleet and the need to have that much rolling stock and the fact that we increase the Smart transit line item by how much? Exclusive of this this year for fit for 2015? Oh, I believe 100. What's that? 120. 110 to 120. Okay, added 10 there, then 25 here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm, fan, I'm a fan. I always have been. I got taught on transportation commission about public transit, um, but just trying to understand keep an eye on it and if i drive across town and see a bus go by me and then i see a dollar ride and then i go by the transit center and there's 27 buses parked out there you need new glasses <laughs> not 27 buses <laughs> then i want to know why there's so many buses councilman steed i i would like to share one experience i had from a few years ago. it's been several years now but um i used to manage the transit system for valley vista in st mary's and um, we had an experience, and when I saw that this was the type of bus that Jenny wanted to purchase, I was very excited. Um, people getting on those lifts in different angles and different things, we actually had someone who got on with a walker who fell off backwards oh, off dear. of the lift, and they died. Um, and that has never left my head in managing Where a Where was that at? It was in St. Mary's, St. Mary's. On, on the Valley Vista system. And with this type of bus, it would be very difficult for something like that to happen and to see that you have a you know a ground level lift that I can't even tell you um, you know not only does it save them money for the workman's comp and all kinds of different things I just know that when we go through our transportation provider meetings online and we go through all different kinds of review looking at different types of funding and vehicles that are out there through the district coordinating council this vehicle has um, probably one of the best ratings. Saves, um, I've heard Kelly Fairless talk about it. It saves on uh, workman's comp claims. It saves on wages. It saves on all kinds of different operating expenses. <coughs> so um, I just feel like this is a really good investment, and I just wanted to share that. Thank you, ma'am. Safety. Thank you. Consent? Yep, absolutely. Let's move forward with it. Okay. Like, and then, like Walter said, it just just worried about the rolling stock I'd love to see us have that third route and it looks like we yeah. almost have a must, enough buses to do it just yeah actually <laughs> for me I would note that in the backup you see that the funding probably will not be accessed until after October 1st it has right. uh, we're carrying it over and it was included in the budget changes and part of that is because the procurement can't really be completed Place by then Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Come see us again soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Gary. Tom Grondon to talk about the East City Rotary and Otnes Park Playground installation <coughs> bid awarding contract. This does not include the acquisition of the equipment. You might want to start with that and explain it to us. All righty. Thank you, Chairman Steed. Uh, currently, or I'm sorry, in previous approvals by the City Council to this past uh, late winter spring in one last year authorized the department to purchase three different sets of playground equipment 
and safety surfacing for Otnes, Rotary, and East City Parks. Uh, the idea being that we'd get those purchases done and in hand and then go to bid for the installation of the three separate playgrounds at one time versus separately uh, as a means of gaining some economies there. And that's the procedure that we have followed to date. Uh, we currently have both sets, two sets of playground equipment in stock at the yard, and the third one will be delivered uh, next week, I believe. So that... Uh, uh, prefacing the installation was our modus operandi. So in late July, the city went out to bid for the three installations of the new playground equipment and safety surfacing at the three mentioned parks. Uh, we received one responsive bid from Picture Perfect Playgrounds out of Ashton, Idaho, totaling $29,958.19 and is within our budgeted amounts for fiscal year. Uh, installation work, assuming approval, would commence on or around August 25th and then be done substantially by mid-October. Uh, park staff, as a portion of the projects and keeping our costs down, will do the removal at East City Park and Rotary Park of just the, the, two, the one smaller playground at each park. So these are for the younger set. Both East City and Rotary have two different sets of equipment, one for uh, five to 12 year old and one for two to four, for example. This is the small, the that, small, that's small guys. Yep. Stuff. So we're replacing equipment that's a bit aged, out of date and so forth. It's a nice upgrade for the city. And the, and the oddness will also be a small kid? That's correct. Okay. I just, because I was just thinking that it wasn't too long ago we replaced the large equipment at East City Park, was it not? Uh, uh, no, it was, I believe it was about 12, 13 years ago. Really? Yep. Time flies. That was like, uh, uh, very either long the ago. first or second in Rogers' replacement program, but uh, that's still in pretty good shape, though, okay. even though heavy use. Uh, so the request today is to recommend acceptance of the bid submitted by Picture Perfect and get the contract consummated and the process rolling. Tom, does having one bidder bother you? Having only uh, one, only one better bother you? Well, in in other instances, perhaps, but this is just a terrific price, much lower than we anticipated. Uh, we're switching over our safety surfacing to uh, rubber uh, <coughs> product as opposed to the chip wood chip ADA compliant, and this requires more concrete work and then the installation of the rubber padding. Uh, but they came in with a very good price and ready to stand by it. So we really only have three contractors in the general area that were interested. And one's out of Spokane and was already booked solid through this fall, and but another one was not responsive. Couldn't work it in. Right. Dan? Yeah, I, I experienced the same thing with only getting one bidder, but still you end up with a pretty decent price. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, since we have the, we got the equipment, we need to get it put up. So. Yeah. I say we move forward with it. Put it on consent. Do it, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Les McDonald with a proposal for some Jackson Street frontage improvements in front of the new EMSI building, formerly new, known as the Daily Idahoans. News. Daily News. Idahoans. Terry, Terry looked at me and said, what's that? What's, what's an Idahoans? What's an Idahoans? Back when I was delivering it, that was the guy home, you know. Good afternoon. There has been a project in the works um, with the owner of the what was the Daily News building, uh, Mark Wentz, uh, for about a year, and it has been before the city council previously involving uh, improvements uh, to the building, improvements along the frontage of the building, and the installation of uh, fiber to the structure. Uh, the city uh, pursued a gym grant uh, last year to support the frontage road uh, improvements on Jackson Street and the fiber installation. The um, city was successful in obtaining that, and the projects have been moving forward. Uh, the building itself has been remodeled uh, quite extensively, as I understand it. The fiber system has been installed, and what remains is the frontage improvements on Jackson Street. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, in the process of going through all of that uh, construction effort over the last nine months or so, um, there have been some financial challenges that have arisen, 
And so we were approached um, at the city about how we could perhaps package this project in a way that it could still occur um, using the remaining grant funds, um, some funds from uh, Mr. Wentz, from EMSI, and some participation by the city. And so that's what we're here to talk about today is uh, really what we have worked out uh, along that line to date and uh, are essentially ready to launch if uh, everybody's okay with what's being proposed. So I'll walk you through a little bit of this. Uh, first off, the site is on Jackson Street, uh, north-south here with 3rd Street shown at the top. 6th Street at the bottom, just to help orient folks. Uh, this is the building that was the Daily News, is now the new home of EMSI. Uh, to the north of that, uh, there is the um, uh, thrift store Salvation and Army. the Salvation Army in there. Um, the existing street conditions are somewhat like this. Uh, the building itself has changed since this street photo was taken. Um, by Google uh, a couple years ago. And the area that uh, is being considered for um, the frontage improvements really starts essentially in, in the vicinity of this crosswalk. This is the beginning of the EMSI building and then extends down to the south end of that building. So it would be this area down through here uh, where these couple of vehicles are parked and really from the north crosswalk to and a little bit beyond the south crosswalk, which is right there. This map is a little bit difficult to see. This is actually off of the, the construction drawings, uh, but it essentially shows the improvement as being Jackson Street on this uh, top of the screen. North is to the left. Um, the existing curb line runs down through about here. And what will be happening is a widening of the sidewalk uh, with the inclusion of new trees, uh, the vintage style lights that we used on College Street, uh, a little bit of drainage, uh, things of that nature, uh, zooming in just a little bit. Uh, we're going, in essence, to a 14 and a half foot wide sidewalk. Uh, so it, it really opens up what's a pretty narrow and, and somewhat poor condition sidewalk today. Uh, gives room for some of those street um, frontage features like the trees and the vintage style lights. Uh, potentially, you could see uh, you know, some bike racks and or benches, things of that nature uh, within this furniture zone between the trees at some point in the future while retaining a, a fairly wide, uh, I believe it's about six feet, uh, yeah, about six feet or a little greater actually of uh, walk through here, um, replacement uh, sidewalk in much better condition than what's out there today. Uh, just a couple of quick shots. Yeah, there's the cross section of the sidewalk, so 14 and a half feet out to the back of the curb line, and then a section with the trees. Uh, they will have uh, tree wells like we have on College Street with uh, the, the metal grates around them, um, five foot square tree wells placed, uh, I think it's about three feet off of the curb line itself, so we get adequate clearance from the highway. So that's the project, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was uh, funded through the Jim Grant program. There was a $50,000 grant. Uh, of that, about 17000 has gone towards the fiber project, so the remaining roughly $32,000 uh, would be available for this frontage improvement. The funding package that we have worked out uh, with Mr. Wentz and with the representative from EMSI is reflected here in this summary and, and the pricing is based upon um, the quotes that were given to Mr. Wentz from his contractor uh, for the street related work. Uh, there were a few pieces that were not within that such as installation of the tree grates themselves, the uh, testing of the concrete and, and soil by a geotech firm and the actual lights themselves. Uh, so we're working on those three items with some numbers from uh, our records here at the engineering uh, department uh, with respect to what we've seen on past prices for that type of installation. So with all of that in, in a package, um, with a 15% contingency, uh, we were seeing numbers um, actually just a little bit below this total of 100,000. I rounded up a little bit here. Um, and 
the proposed distribution for funding this would be roughly the 32,000 remaining in the Jim Grant, um, about 5,000 or a little less out of the sidewalk program, approximately 14,000 or a little less out of the streetlight program, 4,100 on the arts program to deal with the tree grates on the, the five trees. And then 15,000 or up to 15,000 uh, from Mr. Wentz and up to 30,000 from EMSI. Uh, so in total, uh, just a, a touch over 100,000, that includes the 15% contingency that we've put on the pricing um, that we've received. Of those items, the EMI, MSI contribution would be subject, if approved, to a URA public infrastructure reimbursement agreement. And that is something that is being drafted right now. Uh, it is anticipated that it will go to the URA board on Wednesday this week for consideration. Uh, that agreement is likely to uh, include the, the typical approach, which is um, reimbursement uh, at a level that's equivalent to about half the tax increment increase on an annual basis up to 10 years um, and up to the amount that would be specified or that was expended with the project as shown here of 30,000 possibly less than that if the prices come in lower tax increment on this building alone on this building alone and how much Gary, was that you correct again? me on that if I misstated no, that but I think that's so correct so. what did it go how much was that you said it would be one half of the annual tax increment increase that is due to this building's improvement or increased value, if you will. So if, for instance, the, the remodel of this building resulted in, I'll just pick a number, a $2,000 or I'll say a $3,000 um, tax increase, then only 1500 of that would be reimbursable to EMSI or the owner, in this case, Mark Wentz, under the agreement through a period of up to 10 years. I think a 10-year term is what they're looking at. Um, if the total amount is, is um, reached before the 10-year term, then it would terminate with the point at which the full reimbursement occurs. If the total amount is not reached in the 10-year term, it just ends at 10 years, and they end up with less reimbursement than was anticipated or expended uh, for the project. So that one is subject to approval by the board and, like I say, is in draft, uh, the, is being drafted now. The reimbursement is only to the EMSI money? No. Wentz is included as well. Oh. That's that private contribution, so it would be up to forty five thousand. Is it up to forty five? Okay. The reimbursements under the URA can only be for public infrastructure typically, uh, and then these would be eligible costs uh, under that scenario. So so that's what's proposed. Uh, what we're looking for here is just uh, continued concern, concurrence uh, with the, the approach. Um, the city expenditures uh, are within programs that are already in our budgets. Uh, we have sufficient budget uh, in those programs under the 14 and 15 uh, fiscal years to um, cover these costs. And the type of work that's being proposed for the city contributions are consistent with those programs. The sidewalk program portion of that would be the 30 percent um, participation by the city for downtown street sidewalk improvements that we've been doing um, throughout the downtown area over the last several years. Streetlight program is replacing the uh, Cobra headlights that are out there today, putting in LEDs with the uh, more you know, higher efficiency but using our vintage style lights uh, that, as I said, we used on College Street. And the arts program being the um, art um, approved uh, tree grates that we've used, similar to what we've done on college, but I think it's actually a different design in this case. City staff would also participate through the streets department with some of the demo on the sidewalk and curb, which is what we've done on other downtown street projects or sidewalk projects to help keep those costs down. There's a value to that of roughly $2,500. I would note that the remodeling of the uh, news review building for EMSI was not one that required public improvements on this street. So it's merely an opportunity for us to partner in a public-private partnership with the hopefully the reimbursement assistance of the URA to get that Jackson Street streetscape to the point where it becomes more inviting, more pedestrian friendly. As you'll recall, this is also an area where um, Years ago, we had applied for a, a um, 
a uh, community development block grant for downtown. Um, and one of the areas that we targeted was the sidewalk in front of the news review building. Those the, the sidewalk is less indicated, is not in fine shape. It's barely ADA passable, if at all. Wheelchairs have great difficulty coming up there. So by extending that sidewalk, it gives access. We have the new development at the corner of Jackson and Washington that hopefully the restaurant that's going in there, uh, we anticipate that that block will develop over the next couple of years and hopefully we'll be able to take this same elevation and go the entire length of the block if that's possible. And ITD seems to be at this point amenable to that sort of, but of you're improvement. Not proposed just that. Jimmy Jones. No, sir, not at this point. Again, that's a that is that development does not require any improvement to the Jackson side of the street. Dan. So when this is all well number one, we're stripping parking on that side through that section. That's that's yeah. How many spaces? I believe there are about five. I it's five. five or, yeah, I think it's about five in that um, frontage. But it, it's it's an area that's frankly not heavily used for parking. We we don't see cars there too often, but occasionally you see a few. And it's three hour now anyway. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is it in the three hour parking I think area? That may be. It is. Is it? Well, I have to think about that. I, I think it runs down the middle of that street. I think it is. I would presume it was three meters. Yeah, I would have to check, but I don't know that. Um, I don't think so. Also, who's responsible for the sidewalk when all this is done? For well, what part of it? Future, future maintenance of the sidewalk. Well, it would be the case as all sidewalks have in the city, which is that adjacent property owner. Okay. Uh, I want to know. Yes, sir. This is the only stretch of sidewalk that has this narrow issue. Is that correct? Or is it all the way down to 6th Street? Well, the anywhere that the buildings are fairly close, well, for instance, the uh, the, the thrift shop to the north, um, I think, has the same situation. So that entire block of buildings. So does the church. Back up here a minute. Um, so I think all of, all of the frontage here has the issue. Um, it's a little more open here, but it's, you know, it's an asphalt parking lot yeah. to the rear. So if it is restricted, there's a little more room, although you, there are some Change little curves and changes in elevations that create issues. So um, do you anticipate in the future having right. to remove parking all the way, that whole area, all the way from 3rd Street down to the church? Yeah, th this is actually something we've we've contemplated in the past is doing that very thing with the idea of, of doing what has been proposed here which is widening that, that street sidewalk frontage so we get more of that you know, urban downtown feel rather than you're on a highway yeah. feel that's there today. Um, to make it wide enough so it's a more comfortable place for the pedestrians and the, and the folks that are on that sidewalk system in front of those businesses. You know, as this area continues to redevelop and we're anticipating you know, the parking lots all the way along here will probably all redevelop in some fashion as Jimmy John's is going in now, um, then the use of that sidewalk will increase. And so having that wider walk, uh, just you know, a higher comfort level. We have, we have talked about doing this treatment all the way through here, and actually ITD encouraged that when we took this to them. They, they felt it would actually be better if it covered everything from 3rd to 6th Street um, so that it was consistent all the way through. But, a, but after we start heading south from the MSI building, it opens up because the buildings are not built right up to the property line. Except right, for the true. Cowan building. Excuse me? Ted Cowan's building is right That's on the true. property That's line. That's true, it is. This I, one I, here, I believe, is that Cowan's? Yeah, I would yeah. note that it's also broken up. You're not losing that much parking because you have driveways, curb cuts, up and down that you don't have parking in between. Yeah. Then you have the free right turn lane, whether it's designated that way or yeah, not. It's there, it's 6th, right? South going into the university. So there's actually not as dense this is parking the, as you would think. this is the most parking, really. It is. It's what? I think this is the biggest section of parking, really. Yeah. Along the curb line. Along that right. section. Um, another thing, I guess, um, would it um, behoove us to extend this north a little ways in front in front of the thrift store? I mean, what what kind of? I mean, I'm looking at economy of scale here and and trying to get it all done at once type of thing. 
Gary's got a big grin on his yeah, face. We discussed this pretty extensively about, you know, with the Jimmy Johns coming in, <clears throat> and eventually we think that the she old Chevron station will also improve. Mm -hmm. We talked about that, and Les well, and his staff ran numbers on it. In whose lifetime? Yeah, it's, well, I don't know. <laughs> the section that's in front of the news review building actually is, what, roughly a f less than a fifth of the of the length of that block. So it would be a lot of money. Well, well what about the, just to the, just that much more up past the old Creighton's building, or the Salvation Army? If the council, if the committee's direction is for us to price that out and identify some uh, opportunities for funding, we could certainly do that. I will tell you that uh, from the URA's perspective, and that's what I've been working on, is I, I serve as interim director. Um, we did get some pretty good pricing out of McCall's. Mm -hmm. Whether they would extend that that length, I don't know. The pricing I thought was pretty competitive, was, didn't you, yes. Les? I did. I did. Yes. So we could certainly review that and bring that to you if it, you like. We're already going just a little bit into the Salvation Army building. You're going, yeah, it if seems you go to be back just a little. You, if you go back into your uh, construction drawing. I think you can see the see the sure. building line. I believe that shaded line in the bottom left is the property line. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Right, and, and it's being extended that much further north to deal with the, the, the crosswalk. crosswalk. Yes. Yeah, because we have to so get yeah, past I mean, that. So, yeah, I mean, you're not coming that much more to get the whole building in, are you? But There's probably another 40 feet, 40 feet or so, yeah. somewhere in that range. We could certainly look at that and see if that's something that uh, you know, we could identify funding for, and if McCall's would be willing to extend. Well, I think it'd be worth uh, looking at. I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's it becomes a question of you know just there's that much more city cost, timing, and, and where does it come from? But well, the I know they want to move ahead as quickly as possible. Uh, we've not made that. We could certainly make the overture. Mm -hmm. Part of the issue you've got here is that Wince is responsible for the construction of this section we're talking about. Right. If it extends north to um, the, the thrift shop, mm -hmm. I don't know if that could, would we have to mm -hmm. take that on or could Wentz just extend that? Uh, we could, what do you probably mean? could do it as far as who manages it. The manages the contract. construction oh. itself. I think we could probably work it such that we, we could continue with the same contractor in, in, in some fashion. Uh, I think there's a way we could manage what we, that. What we could do is, if the council wanted to move this ahead, if you like the concept, we could go ahead and put it on the agenda. We could identify any issues. As we take it through the URA, there have been some delays on this, so the URA has only seen it in concept up till now. Um, I anticipate that they will approve it or consider it and then determine whether they want to approve it on Wednesday. What, what did they figure for the date of construction? This summer? Yes. I would still like to do it this summer. Get it done this yeah. year. Well, we better move on it then. Well, the other aspect to think about is if we do extend north, we have to get it designed because uh, there will be some changes and get it back through ITD because it's a change on the approved but they, construction you know, set. They'd so be, in, they'd be in favor it. of it. I, yes, and I, I suspect that they would you know, do what they could to keep it moving along, but there is some time. I think, I think when we priced that out, I think you did some preliminary work. We did some preliminary pricing actually for the entire stretch from 3rd to 6th uh, based on the early numbers that we had, and I don't think they included McCall's but, actually better numbers. Uh, but Les, all, all you've got to do to tell you your job is figure the linear feet of this, divide it and get a per foot, and just figure how many more feet oh, you the, need. Oh, the pricing part, yeah, that's easy. I mean, that won't, that'll, that'll take a few minutes, but actually... Because it's still the same we move forward, curb, right? gutter, trees, tree wells, lights, etc. Right, we just acquire, apply the additional quantities and we can get there. But uh, Walter, I'd suggest we go ahead and move forward with this as presented and direct staff also to pursue the additional costs and timing for extending it to the driveway for Goodwill. And do you have any ideas? Not Goodwill, but Salvation Army. Salvation Army. Uh, Salvation Army. Yeah. You have any idea where to get the money to pay for it? Well, that's what they do. We'll, we'll have to take it's a look. For them to find. That's right. For them to figure out. I mean, perhaps the way to do it is to place this on the consent agenda if we can identify some things in time for consideration one of you could pull it off and we could okay. present that at that time now we were not holding the thing up okay well we want to move forward with this understand for sure. and if they want to build it this summer we need to move forward so we need to get going okay. i think i think your itd approval is going to be your problem even if you find the money yeah i i think they'll turn around fairly speed. fairly quickly but there is a process involved yeah. and it'll take a little bit of time certainly 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Les has got the next one, too. Thank you much. Okay, next one is Les McDonald with a report on A Street Farm Road to Hatley Edition Master Plan Project Report. <laughs> Be here on time, Mr. Palmer, and you won't get shoved out of the queue. <laughs> He'd be home by now. He's pretty tough, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a lot nicer if I was chair. <laughs> okay, this is a, a fairly new endeavor. Um, we thought it'd be good to uh, bring a report to the committee. I thought it was Gary early on when we kept calling Don Palmer's name that said put him to the end. Wasn't it, Gary? <laughs> I you think really, it was, actually. I'm willing to take the heat. <laughs> you are. Yes, sir. Go, go ahead. Thank you. Um, What's before us is a uh, joint endeavor between the University of Idaho and the City of Moscow. And this is something that uh, the mayor and uh, President Staben have conferred on and felt that uh, there was good opportunity for the two entities to work together uh, to look at some master planning on a corridor that would be an extension of A Street and a property that belongs to the University of Idaho. And so we've been um, working our way towards that. Uh, and I'll uh, tell you about what's going on. So the area we're talking about is what's shown here is the project study area as outlined in the purple line. Um, this is State Highway 8 in red at the bottom of the screen, War Bonnet to the west, uh, Walmart here. This is the mall, Farm Road coming up, and A Street heading off to the east. This is the University of Idaho Dairy that operates out in this area. They're, they're holding ponds and then all the dairy facilities themselves. A Street over the years has been extended uh, to Farm Road and is, as you can see is kind of pointing towards the northwest a little bit and been extended east from War Bonnet uh, to the U of I property and again pointing northeasterly. Uh, that is intentional uh, in that the um, University of Idaho Long Range Master Plan has envisioned uh, and I probably with some consultation to the, with the city you know, 15 or 20 years back, that someday there would be a road through here, an extension of A Street. And so the road alignments, uh, as they were constructed in you know, the past couple of decades, I guess, have uh, taken that into account and pointed themselves in such a direction that that connection, something like this, that's the best terrain could be made. Guess, yeah, the alignment is based upon the topography that's out there. Um, there is a pretty big knob that sits right about in here. Uh, and so that's why this turns away from that, so we don't have to go up and over it or through it. We kind of skirt the north side of it. Uh, there is you know, a fairly decent hill that works its way up fairly steadily as you go to the north. Uh, so this would you know, kind of side hill along through that and eventually uh, meet in the middle. Obviously, uh, for that to happen, the dairy would need to be somewhere else. So that's been... Let me stop you and ask you a question about property lines. What is the green dotted line city limits. Below, the, below the pond? Yeah, that is the city limit, current city limit that comes along, uh, drops down there, around the ponds, back up to here, and then back down, actually jogs all the way down there, right back up, and goes west to the state line. Driveway. Okay. That's the old Montgomery driveway, which is now owned by the university, by the way, that little piece right in there. This university property continues to the north, actually goes up here a little bit further, up kind of up to the ridge top, and then works its way off to the east, and then they own property over in this direction, all use the university. What set the dotted purple lines Parameters, do you know? Uh, that's really a staff line, uh, arbit somewhat arbitrary. Is something that Bill and I worked out. Um, the thought here is that we want to look at property to either side of the arterial, so we want to go out some distance. Um, there is the thought that uh, this area is, well, and that's what's contemplated in the, the long-range master plan for the university, is that this would develop into commercial property. So similar to what happened with the mall, which is university ground, the land, you know, land lease operation uh, to the mall development, they would look at something similar on the property here and, and the property to the north. There's a question, though, of course, how far away from that arterial you can get and still have viable commercial property, maybe motor business type property. Uh, as you get far enough north, it starts to lose uh, its appeal for the development community, if you will, for commercial type development. 
So it's possible that this area further to the north and on up the hill someday could be maybe a high density residential or something of that nature. But the master planning process would help us with that. Right, and the, the idea here is to look at this area. Um, yeah, that north line is somewhat arbitrary, but it was, we had to go somewhere with it. Uh, didn't want to make it too extensive and you know go beyond um, really what we can afford to do. Okay. And it looks like another question. How far, you know, there's this, this concept of a north-south bypass it came in from Airport Road, then it mm -hmm. comes up through that draw. How far north of that, if that ever came through, would that be? Well, there's the, there's the ridge line that runs uh, kind of right here, actually right up about in here, um, and swings north like that. That's where that okay. draws at. That's, where, that's the top draws. of the ridge. Top of the ridge. That's the top of the ridge. Okay. Draws beyond it. Yep. And then it drops off on the other side, and that creek channel out there would be that alignment. So it's it's north a little ways yet. It's not close. Not that close. Not that close. So um, as I was saying, the, the the concept has been that eventually the the um, the dairy would have to move for this to happen, and that's been discussed off and on uh, among U of I circles um, for quite some time. And it sounds like they've reached the point now where they're start. They've sounds like they've identified an alternative location and. It's looking more positive that that could happen. Okay, so okay. with that in mind, um, then it makes sense to start looking at okay, how could this look, and how could the road be developed, and how could the property be utilized um, through commercial development or something of that nature um, <coughs> by the university going into the future. So President Staben and, and um, uh, the mayor got together and, and talked to this through at some point and brought it back to staff, and so we've advanced it this far. Um, the concept here is to go out for a master plan, which would include an, a number of items in a study. So it would start with the basic road layout and design, so preliminary design, horizontal and vertical road alignment. Where does it make sense based on topo topography? We have, you know, an, a, two ends to connect and we know what the topography is and does the, the layout that's previously been penciled out make sense, should it be modified in some fashion. Um, from that, uh, also we would need to look at utility services. How could the area both north and south of the roadway be served with utilities, city and franchise utilities, so power, gas, uh, those types as well. The master planning portion, portion of it for the property would then look at the retail lot layout concepts. So probably we're looking at large scale commercial type development. You know, maybe, maybe it's something perhaps like a Home Depot type of scale. What types of lots could be laid out uh, both north and south based on the topography, the size of the area, uh, the potential use uh, in the commercial realm. Um, with that, of course, would also be at least some rough mass grading concepts because you have to create pads for fairly large footprints of you know buildings, parking lots, things of that nature. So at least some preliminary mass grading concepts. Um, how would those lots be accessed? <coughs> and then general rough grading quantity calculations to help in the cost estimating for the overall concept. If there was opportunity for phasing, how could that be done? So, for instance, uh, if we were to start with, say, the first lot coming off of Farm Road with an extension of A through that first lot, uh, that would be maybe a phase one, what utilities would go with that, what road improvements would go with that, what grading would go with that, um, and then define really what that phase is and other potential phases that would follow along. So they'll be look we'd be looking at that. And then some illustrative site plan and perspective photo simulations. This is kind of an odd term, but essentially it is that kind of architectural mock-up of what would the site look like from a distance, from the highway, from Farm Road, from Warbonnet. Um, that is done as much as anything to help assess how viable <coughs> the property is for large-scale commercial type development. Because if you're, if you're a Home Depot, and I'll keep throwing them out there, um, you want to know that you can be seen from the highway, right? You can be seen from the, uh, the surrounding arterials. On the so other hand, Walmart, you. 
Walmart Moscow didn't care because you couldn't see them from the highway. Cannot see them from the highway. Um, so it depends on obviously the the, the vendor, um, but uh, most cases we've found that there is a desire to be visible. So this step would include then creating some of those visual documents that say, "Hey, here's how it could look from this location," and that could be used as you know. Part of that assessment as to viability of commercial development. I suppose the university could also use them uh, as part of their discussions with potential uh, developers on their property as to how that would look and can they be seen. And then finally, a, a general project development cost estimate. You know, this is planning level scale. You know, 20,000 feet type of, of cost estimate. Looking down uh, as to what would the roads and the utilities and the grading cost. Uh, for this type of development. So that is what uh, is in the uh, proposed um, scope. Uh, we have actually written a request for qualifications uh, for firms to assist the city and the university on this effort. Uh, that was published back on the 2nd. Um, those are due on the 22nd, so here another week and a half away. Um, we've received inquiry now from about, I think, five firms plus a plan center that are interested. Um, and so they've gone on our mailing list for um, information that we're continuing to distribute as we get questions. We're doing this in a, in a method that people will send us questions. We'll put together a summary of those questions with answers and distribute them back to all those folks that have expressed an interest. And uh, anticipate that as we move forward, we'll be looking at selection of consultants in September. It's probably a five to six month long process once we give them a notice to proceed. So generally October through March of 15 would be our anticipated schedule. And your budget? Uh, the budget on this is a total of $50,000 with 25000 from the city and 25000 from the university. That has been uh, included in the draft 2015 budget. <coughs> Question? No, I like it. Yeah, no questions. Questions? No, my buddy that runs the dairy, you'd sure like to know where he's going to end up working. But uh, you know, one of the one of the <coughs> things you did mention that would be a really good spinoff too would is once the dairy's gone and the pond is gone, then we don't have to feel the complaints of people saying our wastewater treatment plant has bad still going to be in fact it's better, better yet if they smell something they'll know it's the wastewater well, that, treatment plant yeah, we we'll, wasn't we'll, going to we'll, say we'll that we'll blame the dairy that's how far they move, sure. where they move the dairy right right okay let's okay. thank you Thanks. Gary anything else on that no sir we will proceed as uh, anticipated okay Don Palmer disbursement report for January uh, for January July 2014 did you spend any money in July Don you sure did Tell us about it. Um, the July uh, disbursements report shows that we have <coughs> spent two million three hundred eighty-seven thousand six hundred thirty-nine dollars and nine cents. This is higher because of the construction season that we're in. Nine hundred ninety-seven thousand three hundred dollars of that is represented by payroll, and we're in the high season, the swimming pool, and and the seasonal uh, employees. So that's higher than what would otherwise be. Construction is $540,000. And that's kind of broken out as $143,000 with the head, uh, head works, $248,000 for the play fields up to this point, $115,000 for North Polk, and then uh, some uh, tank cleaning pumps and whatnot are in the professional services of $87,200, utilities $87,600, Grants forty six thousand, equipment twenty four thousand nine hundred, and vehicles seventy eight thousand seven hundred. Of which that represents a pickup, a couple pickup trucks, one in street, one in sewer, and an explorer for the uh, police vehicle. Those those subcategories represent two point two million dollars, which is roughly ninety two percent of the of the entire amount. Any questions? Tell me again, how much was the ball field? Ball fields uh, for the month of July is 248000 It's a $1.8 million uh, project. So <clears throat> starting to really ramp up. Okay. All right. Do you want to, while we're signing that, do you want to go ahead with the uh, 
updating the 2015 fees. Sure. And you, you may want to couch it in terms of why we have to do this, not just the money changes, but what, sure. what the law calls for. All right. Um, we're, this is going to committee prior to the public hearing that's required by law, as you mentioned, and it's per statute of uh, uh, Idaho Code 631311, which requires uh, the public hearing and any fees that are, that are increased by more than 5%. Uh, the city of Moscow currently uses a fee resolution, was, which is a catalog of all fees. So some fees go up, some fees don't go, uh, are, are actually eliminated, and some fees uh, are new um, as new programs occur. Um, some of the fees that have gone through are the development fees, building valuation, uh, ins uh, various inspection fees, including engineering services fees, um, document fees. Uh, street, street cut and barricade fees, utility fees for water, sewer, um, and sanitation to, to adjust for the cost of capital and capital improvements. The sanitation fees are only related to the tipping portion of that, though. We didn't raise fees for collection at all. So those fees are related to, for like roll carts, con uh, compactors, and any services that are provided out of the transfer station. Uh, other fees that are uh, street banner installation fees, I think that's a brand new fee if I, my recollection serves me right. Uh, removal uh, uh, f a fee, general license fees, and taxi cab, secondhand pawn dealer, peddlers and solicitors, vendors, and other license renewals, as you had heard uh, earlier in the admin meeting, I believe, talked about earlier. Also, the fiber optic service fees, euthanasia, which is just um, uh, increased for our, our cover our costs, van pool escort service, as well as new euthanasia programs. of what, Don? Dogs and cats. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, at the animal shelter. At the animal shelter. Thank you. Yeah, not in the finance department. <laughs> Um, the it's Parks and Recreation that Programs. Was just <laughs> we're listening to you, Don. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, uh, let's see, Parks and Recreation Art, uh, excuse me, changes for fees in Parks and Recreation, <coughs> and then the Moscow Arts class is related to three, to one cl uh, related service that was uh, changed to a three-quarter week time frame. That's the only fee that uh, uh, Moscow Arts had actually uh, changed. So those are a, a kind of a composite. There's, the fee resolution is on the website, I believe, and so it, it's, um, for the public's perusal, and then on August 18th, uh, following the public hearing for the budget, this these fees will be uh, presented at that time as well. Okay. Now, in your in your fee structure, you've got water, sewer, and solid waste fee increases in various places and parts that are a product of recent. Rate studies. Correct. So water had a rate study that was approved a couple of years ago, called for certain changes in rates over the next. Through 2020. Okay. We are in the second year of the water, sewer, and sanitation rate study. And so this is um, to, for, for the public's benefit, and let's need to expand upon that because um, it's the, the only reason the, we're here is for the, the rate, public's benefit. Yeah, the rate study had actually contemplated some significant rate adjustments in the uh, sewer portion of that, of which case they decided to do a two-year phase-in of those fees. Impacted by that um, more significantly was the school district, the University of Idaho, and restaurants. Because of that... They, they found that those were not in the correct balance. They weren't correctly balanced because Between of themselves. because of the uh, contribution that they put load onto the wastewater <coughs> treatment plant. So, uh, in that review, and it was about an eighteen-month process for rate study uh, and rate study consultants, they determined at the at the at the. Well, let me back up. The rate committee also comprised of all of these different classifications: restaurant, University of Idaho, residential. There was a, probably eight or nine folks on, on that uh, committee. And it was decided and passed by city council that this would be a two-year phase-in. And uh, as I stated earlier, this is the second year of that phase-in rate. So. Yeah. so those are included in this. 
Then you also have other rates that are not part of those studies. Yes, that is correct. Those, and because this is a, a, a fee resolution, these are all related to fees, not property taxes, sales tax, or liquor tax, or things that we get through intergovernmental uh, revenues. So this, um, the water sewer sanitation piece of this is about uh, 13, 14 million dollars uh, in revenue. The portion that is related to the general fund is about $595,000. And then the portion related to arts is about, well, farmers markets, 28000 So, um, parks and recreation, I didn't look at that number, but it's about, I would say about 400000 450000 That would include swimming pool. Um, the recreation programs and the youth programs. Um, I had asked Don over the weekend, I left him a message inquiring as to why some rates were going up dramatically. And I got a call earlier today from Bill Belknap, who, well, he didn't quite take credit for all of that, indicated that quite a few of those items were in his department and they were because they had done some studying of what it actually cost the city to handle those things. Bill, do you want to give us a couple of sentences on the types of things that you were talking about and just to comment on the fact that you didn't just do this for the fun of it? <clears throat> Afternoon. Um, yes, yeah, so in preparation of the updating of the of the fee resolution for uh, the upcoming year, we did take a look at our fees, especially for our land use applications, and those those actually show up on the first page, uh, a little bit beyond the first page of the fee resolution, and you will see that there are some, on a percentage basis, fairly sizable increase on conditional use permits, variances, and other land use actions. Uh, we sat down and kind of reviewed. Uh, the increased cost of publication, because all of those actions include at least one, if not two, legal ads published in the newspaper, include mailings to adjacent property owners, oftentimes twice, because there are two hearings on a rezone or a subdivision plat, one before the Planning and Zoning Commission and one before the City Council, and a fair amount of, of direct staff time that's involved in processing those applications. Um, we found that um, what we were charging currently, let's say for a condition use permit at $260, you know, our actual total cost that we were experiencing was $650 to process that application. Uh, so we kind of scheduled in what I had, this was kind of the start of three years of kind of getting ourselves up to a point where we're actually recovering the cost of what it takes to process that application. Um, and so this, what you're seeing is kind of the first of three years of scaling up to, to hit that mark. Do you anticipate coming up this much over the next two more years? It would ultimately be a policy question for the council. If you wish for the applicant to cover the cost of the <clears throat> service that they're being delivered, then that would be what we would need to do. Ultimately, we need to bring that, the cost of that application up to $650. Um, we have looked at other jurisdictions. Um, for that type of application, Post Falls at 750 for a conditional use permit. Sandpoint. Which which one are you looking at? Uh, conditional use permit. Yeah, I'm just picking out a conditional use permit yeah. as one example. Um, but if you look at Post Falls at 750, Sandpoint 530, Missoula uh, at 1714 dollars, and Boise if it's a residential unit, it's 484. And then it goes up by acreage. So if it was a one, a one acre or less, 615, one to five acres, 1,047, which we really don't make any distinction on, on the size. Um, and we've been are, down at 260 last 260 year. For, and You're we, taking it to 390 for 2015. Correct. Right. And anticipating moving it up to what in the end? Uh, anticipating that we'd be at 520 for 16 and 650 for 17. Okay, up to 650. Um, but that is, again, it's a policy question for the council. Who should be paying for that cost? Should it be the, the taxpayer, because we are a general fund entity, or should it be the person that is, you know, essentially going through that process and demanding that, that expense? That's ultimately a question for the council. This is a beginning stage of us really evaluating what is the true cost that we experience. And it doesn't necessarily incorporate everything that goes into this. There, there's a legal expense. There's administration expense for a lot of these land use proceedings because they do tend to be 
litigious in a lot of ways, and, and we're not even really capturing that. I have a 15 percent kind of overhead factor. It's, in, it's intended to capture some of that, but probably not the true cost if we looked at it in reality. So, I mean, those are the more large and the largest changes, and they show up in red on that first page, and so those certainly do stand out. Uh, and we've done that for all the different land use uh, applications, and that's um, the reason why we had some of those increases uh, proposed. It is a recommendation of the council. The council can certainly choose whether you wish to. Don't, don't take offense at this question, but because I know you probably have, but I'll ask it anyway. <clears throat> How hard have you looked at reducing our expenses? To, to give these services is any way we can do it for less money there's really no option that I've identified where we can do it for less um, it takes a certain amount of staff time to meet with the applicant to uh, review the application to prepare the staff report to prepare the presentation to attend the public hearings to write the reason statement for the final decision and to provide the regulatory takings notification you know prepare the notice prepare the notice mailing list all of these things are statutorily required and so there's no way we can actually control a lot of those actions and then all the statutory required hearing publications and notices again um, those are things we have to do there, there are certainly some policy um, decisions that the city has made in the past about uh, what we notice and how long we notice so under state law, many ac actions only require noticing all properties within 300 feet. We do 600 feet. So there is some additional postage expense that, that is experienced there. Um, but in reality, there's not a lot of ways to re reduce the cost on these items. It reminds me of what my dad used to always tell me once in a while. He said, you know, everything seeks, seeks its own level. Water seeks its own level, you know. Eventually, you get to the point where people refuse to do it any longer, and then there won't be any need for it. Then we'll reduce our expenses. Just it's expensive to do business. Walter. Yeah. Yes, sir. You asked a question earlier about the impact of the budget on, on um, a lot of these fees. So I went back and looked at some of this. And you can jump in, if, Bill, and correct me if I'm wrong. But I checked with Leora on a lot of these, and they hit the uh, 422-19 line item, which I believe is the other permits line item. That line item is $6,000. We collect about $595,000 in fees. So some of these fees are a unit cost thing, and we don't even collect some of these fees. As an example, uh, mobile home parks. We haven't collected that fee in years. Nobody's built one. Because nobody's, nobody's built one. one. Yeah. So, so but what he's trying to do is if he did do one, then this is what the fee would be. A lot of these costs or these fees are to recover costs in the event that they do happen. The budget is not predicated on, on some of these activities. So just so you're aware of that. And that budget is at, budgeted at $6,000. So. Okay. What are you going to do? Yes, we'll move, move it forward. Move it forward as law requires. Yep, we will. We'll, we'll do. Um, I would like, Gary, at council to include some explanation about that your staff didn't just sit around either throwing darts at a board or making up numbers, that there is some basis, either rate studies on the enterprise funds or the type of work that Bill has done on his stuff to determine what these numbers should be. I can make a general presentation of the work that's gone into it. I would, I would note just generally yeah, that. I mean, that was my first yeah. reaction. I see all these, this red, and, and I'm looking here, and I got 1.5 and 60% all written down, and I'm thinking, who in the world made this stuff up? Absolutely. And so the question was, who in the world made this stuff up? <laughs> we will have an explanation for you, sir. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? I have nothing. I'm ready to go. I consider that a motion to adjourn, and we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.